free from guilt. We are thankful that he has called us out of this world into a community, uh, to be a community that gives praise to you and glorifies you and honors you in our singing and in our living and in our loving one another as a community. Bless this time of worship this morning, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, uh, welcome to Twickenham. Glad you're here this morning. Thanks for coming out to be with us. If you're a guest, man, are we honored that you are here. It means a lot. You, you could have been anywhere you wanted to be, and you chose to be here, and we're thankful for that. If you are looking for a church home, we are always looking for new family members. We'd love to hear what the Lord's doing in your life. Love to talk about what he's doing here, and he's doing some awesome things here. So let's have a conversation about that. We're just really glad you came. There's a card on the back of the seat in front of you. You can fill that out and place it in the collection plate a little bit later, or actually in just a moment. So you better get cracking on those cards because we're, we're about to send the plates around. If you have a prayer request, you'll want to indicate that on that card, and we will be praying about that uh, first thing tomorrow morning. Let me share a neat scripture with you here. Oh, wait. I'll introduce you to somebody. We have a couple with us this morning that is, uh, we're looking at them to fill our youth ministry position, and they're looking at us, and I hope you guys all behave this morning, okay? I hope you were nice. Uh, we have Caleb and Ashley Gendron. Could you guys stand right here, and this, could you just get, welcome them and let them know we're glad they're here today? So there's a, a great passage uh, in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 9. Yeah, and it's about, it's about what we're about to do, which is, which is giving. But it's not what you would think. I mean, you would think it would be like all about law and command and, you know, God bringing down the hammer and you better give. But it's not. Listen to this. This service that you perform, so what we're about to do, our giving, is a service. The service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God because of the service by which you proved yourselves others other people will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and everyone else and in their prayers for you their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you thanks be to God for his indescribable gift Paul calls, it's not the first, only time he does that, he, Paul, he calls what we're about to do, giving our money, a grace. It's a gift God gives us, and it's so powerful. If you're a guest this morning and you want to give, you're welcome to, okay? We wouldn't stop you from doing that at all, but don't feel obligated. The rest of us, this is our opportunity to give back to the Lord, to, to experience this grace, and to acknowledge that he is God, that he is the one who wears the crown. Not us, not our money, and not anything our money can buy. Let's take up our contribution. Let's continue our time of praise. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne. Heart of a heavy anthem drowned, all music but its own. Awake my soul and see. Oh, 
now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed us to the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. In the day of my salvation, I helped you. I tell you now is the time of God's favor, and now is the day of salvation. On Zion's glorious summit stood a new Bye. 
God, we cannot imagine that you gave your son for us, but we are thankful. We cannot imagine that you allowed his body to be broken on our behalf, but we are thankful. We cannot imagine that you could love us so very, very much, but we are thankful and we remember as we share this bread, a reminder of his body. In Jesus' name we pray and all that agree say, amen. Just as I Still broken, still in need of saving, still in need of you, and remembering the sacrifice that you gave for us. 
that blood had to be shed, that human sacrifice was necessary, is overwhelming. May we be in awe of that very event every day of our lives as we take this cup, which reminds us of the blood that was shed, just as we are. In Jesus' name we pray and all that agree say, amen. Just as I am, am I would be lost, but mercy and grace, my freedom bought, and now to glory in your begin prayers with, uh, would you join me in prayer? I want to double underscore, uh, would you join me in prayer? Uh, this is a special prayer this morning for our teaching time, um, for Jody. But teaching um, involves both a spoken message, a word of, a word, uh, a word of 
of uh, encouragement or words spoken from here, but it involves our heart, it involves a recipient, it involves ears. And so um, as we pray, I do ask for you to join me in prayer for this, for this time to anoint, for God to anoint uh, this time of teaching. Dear God, we look to you. Um, Your ways are not our ways. You're a mysterious uh, God throughout our own life. You open our eyes and you uh, do things in our life that are unexpected, unpredictable. And we just confess, Father, so much we do not know and do not understand. Uh, Today, we... um, we ask you, God, your Holy Spirit, to, to bless and to fill uh, our, our hearts. We ask you for Jody, for the lesson he brings today, for the words that come from his mouth, that, um, that you will direct each, each thought he's prepared, each thing he says. Give him the very, very best communication skills, Father, uh, on his end of this lesson today. But that, that he may deliver seeds from you uh, for our hearts, but help us, Father, to be soil, to be clean, um, deep soil. We need your help, Father. We live in such a polarized times when we just our heart is just full of so many answers and so many opinions. And we need you desperately to help us um, have open and questioning hearts uh, give us today a receptive uh, soil and give us, Father, a, a questioning heart, a, a, a heart that's open to discussion and interaction. Give us discussion and interaction in our church to, so that we may grow and take words and, and see them sp- uh, sprout forth and grow and flourish as you would have us uh, to grow. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let's stand again. This is the season for a new anointing. This is the season for a fresh outpouring. That the sons and daughters of the King of Glory may rise and shine. That the sons and daughters of the King of Glory may rise and shine. As we declare, this is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord is I will rejoice.
Hey, uh, down here on the table is a sign-up sheet, two sign-up sheets, three sign-up sheets for nursery and preschool. And what, what, what we would like to happen is uh, we'd like for you to sign these before you leave today. What, what would be really good is if we got down to the bottom and we started over here or on the back, okay? And if, you're, if you love Jesus... and you want to go to heaven. <laughs> I don't think I'm smiling here. <laughs> hey, one of the most important ministries we have is our children's ministry, and it only functions if you and I are involved. You may, you may not have children this age anymore. You may not have any children at all. You'll, we do a background check, okay? But we need help in these areas, and this matters. I still remember Mary Jones, who taught me in Sunday school when I was a kid. I remember the songs that we sang. I remember the lessons that she gave me. Um, they, they've stayed with me all my life. She has had a lifelong impact on me. And you can do the same with one of our kids. So check those out as we leave this morning. Be sure and come by and, and sign up and at least learn about it, okay? So <clears throat> I told you this story when I... I taught the combined Sunday school here uh, in the auditorium on our tryout Sunday, our interview Sunday. I told this story during that, that period. So you've heard it before, but it's a good story. And last week, one of our members, who shall remain nameless, told me that they really loved one of my recent sermons, and when I said which one, they couldn't remember the title, the text, the date, or what it was about. So I'm figuring if one of our elders can't remember, or, or, it wasn't an elder, okay. I figure about 75% of you don't remember this story, okay, but in, anyway, it's a good story. At our, at our first church, I did this wedding, and it was a fairly typical wedding. The bride and groom were glassy-eyed from too little sleep and too much pressure, too much stress. And so they were barely able to respond to my prompts, you know, do you take this woman, that kind of thing, much less maintain an appreciable, appreciable level of situational awareness. They just were out of it. So I'm up there preaching the homily, the sermon part of the wedding, and they're being glassy-eyed and all of a sudden, I noticed that one of our elders starts coming toward the front. He gets up out of his seat, and he starts walking toward the front, a guy named Don Wood. And he, he comes toward the bride and the groom and the wedding party and me. And at first, I thought he was going to the bathroom, but then I realized the bathrooms are in the back. He wouldn't be coming this way. And he marched, he marched right up the steps. And as he, as he, walked by, as he came by me, I, I kept talking, but I turned to follow him. And we had our church um, building was typical of late 1960s or early 1960s Church of Christ architecture, which is to say uninspiring. <laughs> behind, the, behind the lectern above the dais was the baptistry, which is normal. That's usually where they are. And above the baptistry, someone had painted a mural of a river, and it was hideous. It, it lacked depth and perspective and art. It was awful. <laughs> so when we had a wedding, we closed the curtains to hide it. This wedding was in July. It was so hot, the devil was fanning himself. It was just an awful hot day. The air conditioning kicked on. The baptistry curtains, which we had closed, billowed out and touched the burning candles that the florist had placed on stage, and apparently the curtains were not treated with any kind of effective flame retardant because they went up in flames. <laughs> they went up in flames like the Falcons in the fourth quarter of last year's Super Bowl. <laughs> and that's why Don walked up on stage. And he, 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 he was a big man. And he, he grabbed the flaming curtains and he jerked them down into the baptistry 
extinguishing the flames. I don't know what we'd have done if we'd been Methodist. It would have been <laughs> really bad. So anyway, he, he douses the flames and he turns around and he, as, he, as he walks back by me, he goes, carry on. And just <laughs> went on down to his seat. So, and at that point, nobody knew what to do. I didn't know how to get back into it. The audience was sitting there in stunned silence. The bride and groom were still glassy eyed. I don't even think they noticed what had happened. And we, there was this grandmother sitting on the second row or so, and she was a real Southern belle, an Atlanta native, and she, it's, it's dead quiet in the room. And she pats her cheeks and she goes, oh my Lord, we've had a baptism of fire. So, <laughs> true story. True story. I told you it was good. So, hey, weddings are, weddings are hard, right? They just are. And marriage is hard, and family, family is hard, but it's good, it's good and messy, and that's the series we're in right now. Family is good and messy. Here's another thing I've said to you before. In fact, I said this thing on our first official Sunday together when we'd done the interviews and everybody would signed the contract, and it was our first official Sunday I preached a sermon, I think the title of it was What We Need From Each Other, and it was based on Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, where Paul says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And I said something like this, doing that, keeping the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace is really easy today. I mean, it, this all feels really good, everybody's in a good mood, you're, you know, your search is over, my search is over, we're... we're uh, everybody's on their best behavior. We, we haven't had any time to offend each other. It's all good right now. It's almost like a wedding day. But there will come a day when I say some things you won't like, when I say some things that will make you uncomfortable, some things that you don't agree with. And that's when our unity will be tested. And we'll have to remember that our unity is a gift of God's spirit, that it's not based on our agreement or our ability to argue a point or to win a debate or to sway people to our side or our opinion. Our unity is based on what God did for us through Jesus on the cross. That, or, or pretty much something like it, is what I said. And this may be that day, <laughs> okay? This may be the day when I say something you're not entirely comfortable with. I, I may say more than you wanted me to say. I may say less than you wish I would say. But we're going to be talking about marriage and who it's for and how long it's supposed to last. And that's been a difficult subject for a lot of centuries. So let's pray. Let's bow. Lord God, you have set us in families where we learn to live together in love and truth. Strengthen weak bonds of love. Where separation threatens move in with forgiving power. Melt hard hearts, free fixed minds, break the hold of stubborn pride. God of mercy, you are always working to hold us together, to heal division, to make love strong, to meet the messes we make with your grace. Instruct us in better love so that our vows may be kept with new resolve. Lay claim on us so that our individual claims may be set aside in love. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to do a quick recap of last week because we kind of laid some foundation that was pretty important stuff. We, we looked at three families in the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, and all three families were a mess. They were a rolling dumpster fire, a National Transportation Safety Board accident report with pilot error as the cause of the crash. But the big takeaway last week was this. The concept of family is not rooted in philosophy or sociology or um, psychology. It's rooted in theology, in things about God. The, the idea of family emerges from a theological mystery called the Trinity. Three distinct, fully differentiated beings, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, 
form an indivisible unity, which means that the idea of family, the concept of family, is older than creation itself. And and since we are all made in God's image, and we touched on this last week as well, since we are all made in God's image, no matter how much we mess it up, we are drawn back to this good idea, this great idea called family. Family is how God lives, and we are made to live like God. Whether you marry or stay single, everybody is wired to live in meaningful connection with other people. And though it's not the only way to meaningfully, meaningfully connect with others, marriage is the foundation of family life. And that foundation has been under pressure for centuries, as you'll see when we look at our text this morning, which by the way is Matthew chapter 19, if you want to look in that. Last week we were in the first book of the Old Testament, this week we're in the first book of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 19 is where we'll be. The foundation of marriage has been under assault for centuries, but in 1969, something happened in California that began to erode the foundation of marriage in the United States in a new way. Conservative icon Ronald Reagan signed the nation's first no-fault divorce law. Marriage became little more than a contract between two people, no longer a covenant, now it became a contract between two people. And just by checking a couple of boxes and paying a couple of lawyers, you could undo, I do. No harm, no foul, no fault. And soon other states began to write their own easy divorce laws. And the last state to adopt the no-fault divorce was, and you would never guess, if I gave you 50 guesses, you'd guess it dead last, because you already think it must be Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, Tennessee, Mississippi, or Arkansas, one of the six southern states, right? It's got to be one of us that, that was the last to come up with it. It was New York. New York was the last to come up with it. And you'll never guess who opposed it, why it took so long. 2010 is when they passed theirs. The National Organization of Women opposed the no-fault divorce laws. So Reagan started it. The National Organization of Women opposed it. Politics is whack. That's all that means. So what we want to do is see what Jesus says about marriage this morning. So we're going to look at Matthew chapter 19. And we're going to begin in verse 3. And so here's the roadmap of where we're going to go. We're going to read this passage, verses 3 through 10. And then we're going to look at the context, what's what's going on around the passage that we read. And then I'm going to share two core principles of Jesus' teaching. And then we'll confront three hard questions. Text, context, two core principles, three hard questions. So let's read, beginning in verse 3. Matthew 19, some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, the man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you, that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. The disciples said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and wife, it is better not to marry. Now, as with any passage of scripture, it's important to pay attention to what's going on around it. It's what we call the context. And there are two levels of context here that I want us to pay attention to, the literary context and the historical context. By literary context, I mean we need to think about where Matthew places this story in his gospel and why he puts it there, or at least try to at least think about 
may not be able to answer those questions, but we can think about them. Jesus' teaching on marriage is preceded by his teaching on forgiveness and mercy. That's, I think that's critical. Jesus' teaching on marriage is preceded by his teaching on forgiveness and mercy. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 21, Peter comes to Jesus and he says, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Seven times? And I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty generous to me. I mean, if you come and if you sin against me and I forgive you, quite frankly, I feel pretty good about me. And if you sin against me twice and I forgive you twice, I feel really good about me. I might even tell somebody that I forgave you. If you sin against me three, four, five, six, seven times, and I forgive you every time, I'm putting myself up for saint of the year award, because that's awesome. Peter sounds like he's being really generous here, which I think he probably thinks he is. He is, but Jesus says no, more like 77 times. And that, he doesn't mean to keep score. He doesn't mean to literally count forgiving somebody 77 times and on the 78th time you're free. Jesus means you just keep on forgiving. And we know that because he tells a story after he says that. It's about a man who owed millions of dollars to this king and he couldn't pay it and so the king forgave him. And then the forgiven debtor goes out and confronts somebody that owes him a couple of hundred bucks and when the guy can't pay the two bills, the, the guy that was forgiven a million forecloses on his loan, throws him in jail. And when the king hears about it, he's livid. And he goes out and he gets the guy that was forgiven the millions, but didn't forgive somebody that owed a couple hundred bucks. And the king throws that guy into jail. And then Jesus concludes that story in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 18, verse 35, this way. This is how my heavenly father will treat you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Man, that's a sober warning as you enter a discussion on marriage. Because few, few human relationships come preloaded with a need for forgiveness more than marriage does. And just to be real direct here, if you've got an ex-spouse, you might want to take a look at this passage on forgiveness. You, you need to take this to heart and forgive from your heart. If you're married to somebody right now and you are holding some grudges that go back against your mate, you might really want to read that passage on forgiveness. And the truth is, the church needs to hear this. Because at times in our history, we, we have been unforgiving of those who endured divorce. We need to remember how comprehensive, all-encompassing, and even scandalous is the forgiveness that is available through Jesus. But there's a lot of a lot to touch a lot of us right there about forgiveness. So that's what comes before Jesus' teaching on marriage, this strong word on forgiveness. Now, I want you to take a look at what comes after his teaching on marriage. Matthew chapter 19, verses 13 and 14. Then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them, but the disciples rebuked them. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. You got forgiveness, teaching on marriage and divorce, and then this teaching about children. Look, I can't tell you, I cannot tell you that Matthew put this story about Jesus and the children after his teaching about marriage and divorce, because Matthew knew just through his own experience or by inspiration that later on, psychologists and sociologists were going to do massive studies on children of divorce and conclude remarkably that divorce was bad for kids. I can't tell you that that's what why Matthew put that story here. But I think it's really interesting that these three passages sit next to each other on the page. All this teaching on forgiveness, this teaching on marriage and divorce, and this teaching about children and letting them come to Christ. It's interesting they all sit there together. That's the literary context. The second level of context that we need to think about is the historical context. What was going on in the culture in that historical moment when Jesus taught this stuff? What, what was the world like? And what was his world like in that day? Well, 
in, in his culture at that time, divorce was an accepted norm and commitment in marriage was tenuous at best. There were two schools of thought among the Jews at the time. One was led by a rabbi named Hillel and the other by a rabbi named Shemai. Hillel said that a, that a, a man could divorce his wife for any and every cause. Uh, Hillel said that if she you know, burned your supper, you could divorce her. There was another rabbi named Akiba, I think, who said that if you found another woman who was better looking than your current wife, you could divorce your wife and marry the better looking woman. Needless to say, guys like Hillel and Akiba were really popular with about half the population. Shemai taught that a man could divorce his wife only if she was guilty of immorality or something equally serious. That, that, was, that was what was going on in the culture then. And you notice how his own disciples reacted when they heard Jesus say that God's will was for marriage to be a permanent arrangement dissolved only by the unfaithfulness of one of the partners. They said, if this is how it is with a husband and a wife, maybe it's better not even to marry. How's that for a high view of marriage? So there's the context, okay? All this teaching on forgiveness, preceding this teaching on marriage and divorce, and then a culture in which there's a lot of division going on. So let's look deeper in the passage. Verse 3 says, the Pharisees, then that's a sect of, the, of, of Jewish r- religious experts, they came to test him with a question about marriage. Why, why would they do that? Why would they try to test him with a question about marriage? A couple of possibilities. If they could get him to pick a side, they could dilute his influence. Like if he took Hillel's side, the liberal side, then all of Shemai's disciples would be unhappy with him, not to mention the women. And Jesus was really popular with women. You go through and read the Gospels sometimes, some of his most ardent, faithful, supportive followers were women. So if they get him to take Hillel's side, then he alienates Shemai's disciples and women. If they take Shemai's side, he, he makes a bunch of enemies on the, other, on the other side. And then there's this, a little bit earlier than this story, um, the, the ruler of, of Galilee, Herod, had beheaded a man named John the Baptist, who was another preacher. John the Baptist had preached a sermon that Herod was in the wrong for marrying his brother Philip's wife. So Herod had John the Baptist beheaded. Well, Herod's wife actually did it because she didn't like the sermon either. So now I think maybe the Pharisees are thinking, we get Jesus to say he's against divorce, maybe that'll put him in trouble with Herod and that'll solve our problem. So they, they come to him with this question. What do you think about this issue, Jesus? Now, now look at verse 4. What's the first thing he does when they ask him the question? Jesus asks a question of his own. Haven't you read? In other words, have you not read Moses? Have you not read your Bible? He immediately points to Scripture, and that brings up the first core teaching that I want to share with you this morning. Jesus insisted This is the first core teaching in this passage. He insisted that social custom, personal preference, and religious policy be submitted to the authority of Scripture. Jesus was not swayed by what Hillel or Shemai said. He wasn't impressed with the social customs of his day. He was unafraid of what Herod might do, and he was unintimidated by the personal preferences of his own disciples or anybody else. He was interested in what God's Word had to say about the issue. He insisted that every aspect of our lives be submitted to the authority of Scripture, which could make make us a little bit uncomfortable sometimes. Because we think if we use words like authority and submission and scripture and obedience, that that's going to scare some folks off. They'll think we're being too preachy or too extreme. So let me say two things about that. First, if somebody is interested in Jesus, don't you think they, need to, they deserve to know the whole deal? I mean, is there grace and mercy and forgiveness? Yes. Is salvation absolutely free? 
absolutely. You can't buy it. I can't buy it. If we pooled all of our goodness resources and righteous resources together, we couldn't buy enough salvation for one of us. Salvation is absolutely free. But there's another S word in the Bible, sanctification. These two words, salvation and sanctification, explain why we can be good and messy. Salvation means that we're saved from our sin, that we're included in the family of God, and that we are forgiven. We are good. I come broken. That's how we come. Sanctification means that we are being continually formed into a more perfect reflection of the character of God. We are becoming a more accurate reflection of his image. We are messy. And God's Spirit is working to clean us up. I come broken to be mended, we sang a minute ago. Salvation is free. Sanctification will cost you something. Some of our habits will have to be gotten rid of and replaced. Some of our priorities will have to be reordered. Some of our moral and ethical software will have to be updated. People interested in Jesus need to know that. Salvation is free, but once he saves you, he is not going to leave you alone. He's going to keep working on you until you reflect the image of God perfectly. That's often painful. The second thing I'd say about this fear that if we talk too much about obedience and submission and authority, why do you, why do you think people are looking into Jesus anyway? It is not like anything else out there is working right now. A lot of families are just a mess. And maybe they are ready to try something new and different. And if our message is no different from the narratives they get on television and the movies and contemporary literature, why would they look to Jesus at all? So let's look deeper at what he taught. Verses 4 through 6. Haven't you read, he's pointing them back to Scripture, Haven't you read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, we hear this at weddings sometimes, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Here's the second core teaching. Jesus' intent was to recover God's original plan for marriage. One man, one woman, living in a permanent relationship characterized by faithfulness and unity. I say that's God's original plan because Jesus goes all the way back to Genesis. At the beginning, he said. That's where we started last week. Remember how we talked about that pattern? God speaks, something is created, it's pronounced good. Everything in creation was good. It's all good except for one thing. In Genesis 2.18, God sees one not good thing. Adam is alone, and so he creates Eve, and she becomes Adam's wife. Marriage was the solution to the only not good thing in creation. It is God's original plan. And it's a permanent relationship. God intended for marriage to be a permanent relationship relationship. Jesus says they are no longer two but one, one flesh, and what God has joined together, let no one separate. That's God's will. That's God's plan. Marriage is hard. Abraham Lincoln said, marriage is neither heaven nor hell. It's simply purgatory which is in Catholic doctrine is the place you go to pay for your venal sins, which is a pretty dismal view of marriage. But do you remember where Mary Todd Lincoln was the night the president was assassinated by John Wilkes Booth? She sitting right next to him in that theater. Marriage is hard. But it is God's will for us to stay married. And some of us are thinking about giving up. And you're tired. You're tired of working on it. I implore you, keep working. Some of us 
feel like we don't love our husbands or our wives anymore, that we can't imagine ever loving them again, can't figure out why we ever loved them to begin with, I implore you, keep trying. Love is, love is not about how you feel. It is about what you do. Some of us have gone even further. We've contacted a lawyer. We're thinking about contacting a lawyer. I implore you, forget the lawyer. Call a brother or sister here at Twickenham. Call a counselor. We have counselors here at church. We know good counselors in town. Call one of our elders. Call one of our ministers. Look, you know I had a past when I came here. So when I talk about working on it, I'm not just blowing smoke. Lisa and I have done that work, and it is hard, and it is heavy, and it is heartbreaking. And you ask either one of us, and we will tell you it is worth every aching minute because marriage might be messy, but it is good, and it can be great. As awful as you believe your marriage is right now, I will testify to you that with the help of the, the God who raised Jesus from the dead and the Holy Spirit who can indwell every human being who gives his life to Christ, marriage can be great. Two core principles. Social custom, personal preference, religious policy must be submitted to the authority of Scripture. And God's original plan is, for, is marriage between one man and one woman living in a permanent relationship characterized by faithfulness and unity. Those are the two core principles. Here are three hard questions that often come up. What I'm going to give you is not a complete answer to these questions, but I want to respond to them. What if I'm in an abusive relationship? Does God want me to stay married and stay in this abusive relationship? Absolutely not. No. There is a difference between a disappointing and a difficult marriage and a destructive or damaging marriage. If you or your children are being physically or emotionally abused, you need to seek help immediately. The abuse is not your fault. Oh, please hear me say that. The abuse is not your fault. It is not your children's fault. You have both the power and the freedom to put you and your children in a safe environment. We are your church. We will walk with you through that. Second question. What if divorce is already a part of my story? First, I want to acknowledge the, the pain of that experience. One blogger I read recently called divorce, and she had been through one, she called it a, a relationship fatality. Even though divorce is, is really common, it is still a crushing event for people. And I'm so sorry if you've gone through one, I'm so sorry that you've been through it. That had to be, just the experience had to be awful. I hope that if it happened here, we were there for you or wherever you were, I hope the church responded to that. Underneath, all the reasons a marriage ends in divorce. After we get through with the lawyer's questions and accusations and we get through the counselors and we get through the yelling in the bedroom at 3 o'clock in the morning, after we get past all of the reasons a marriage ends in divorce and you pull all that away and look down underneath, what you find is that there is sin. Marriages end because of sin. But you are only responsible for the sin that is yours. You're not responsible for somebody else's. If you have confessed that sin, repented of that sin, and asked God to forgive, then you, you need to embrace that forgiveness. The passages that confront sin are no more true and biblical than the passages that promise forgiveness of sin when we repent and confess and seek God's forgiveness. If you have not confessed and repented and asked for forgiveness, then you need to do that. We're, we're trying to do two things here at Twickenham. We, we want to be a church that believes and practices God's will for marriage. One man, one woman, living in a permanent relationship characterized by faithfulness and unity. And we want to be a church that embraces the extravagant promises of grace. If anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creature. The old is, is gone. The new has come. And I can't tell you that we're always going to do that perfectly. 
And, and you and I both know that, that human beings are so good at making a mess that we can put Scripture in conflict with itself sometimes. I don't know the answer to every situation. I just know that we want to be a church that embraces this core teaching of Jesus. One man, one woman, permanently committed. And we want to be a church that embraces forgiveness and grace and mercy. We won't always do that perfectly, but that's where our heart is. Third question, what about same-sex marriage? First thing I think we need to say in this regard is that the church has not always responded well, either to the issue or to people who struggle with same-sex attraction. We're, we're afraid to talk about it. We're afraid we're going to say the wrong thing. We're afraid we'll say too much or not enough or we'll say it the wrong way. We're afraid that we'll be perceived as extremists on the one hand or people who don't care about the truth on the other. We're afraid of hurting people that we love. We have family members that we care about. Sometimes we have children. Sometimes we have brothers or sisters in our family, parents. And, and we, it, it's just, it's very hard for us to figure out how to respond. Too often, the church has been more about shame than grace. As far as how we deal with this very real and difficult issue, I would say that it's fair to say the Spirit still has some sanctifying work to do on us. Our response has often been quite messy. We cannot claim permissions the Bible does not give. In a variety of passages, in both Old and New Testaments, homosexual behavior is considered to be outside God's will. And the Bible simply does not know anything about a permanent same-sex relationship that is anything like marriage. But if we really believe that human beings are created in the image of God and are made to live in meaningful connection with others, then we have to be a church that offers people opportunities for non-sexual intimacy, deep friendship, and loving family. We have to be a church that would welcome people who are struggling with same-sex attraction and provide them with godly, holy, loving family. A lot of people are facing the struggle of same-sex attraction alone. They feel out of step with their families. They're out of step with their church. They're out of step even with God. They are the object of gossip, and they are bullied. And for many people struggling with same-sex attraction, there's a deep sense of shame and guilt, and usually they're facing all of that alone. Psalm 68 says that God sets the lonely in families. I, I can't say that we will always do it well, but don't we want to be the church where the lonely can be set? Don't we want to be a church that can be a family to all the lonely people, whether they're divorced, same-sex attracted, suffering from abuse, victims of human trafficking, or just alone? Don't we want to be that kind of church? It is messy to try and hold these biblical truths about marriage and to do so in a world that has been twisted and turned upside down and confused by sin. That's our call, and we won't always do it right. So isn't it awesome that not only are we saved by grace, but we live as a community by grace, and we serve by grace? That is a good thing. You've listened well. You've been so respectful. God bless us as we try to deal with this. Can we stand? Let's sing together once again about God's goodness to us. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings, who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in our
That's tough. Thank you very much. A uh, couple things as we close, really just quick. Again, don't forget the summer volunteers. If you don't get a chance to sign up, you can call the office, talk to one of the front office people, ask for Amy, and they'll be glad to sign you up. Also, uh, May 31st, Wednesday, is our Ecuador mission trip fundraiser dinner. There are tickets available in the uh, front lobby and in this uh, education wing lobby. So pick those up and help us support our trip. And very interesting that this would happen on this particular day. I was greeted earlier by one of our senior members who uh, caught my attention and said, hey, I need you to talk to you, and you need to make an announcement for me today, right now, which is how she normally talks to me. So that wasn't strange. And I said, well, okay, sure, what can I do for you? She goes, well, she goes, tomorrow is our uh, anniversary. And I said, well, that's great. How long have you been married? She said, um, and I said, well, should I guess, 49? No, no, that's not it. And I finally said, well, when did you get married? And she said, well, 1949. I go, okay, 49, that's 51, that's, that's 68. How many of you are 67 or younger? Could you raise your hands? Yeah, most of us. They've been married longer than we've been alive. Travis and Sarah McMinn has 68 years tomorrow. Congratulations. It's great to have you. Great to have all of you. Thanks for being here. Have a great week. And let's close in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for uh, this day, Lord. We're thankful we could come and worship you together, and we're so thankful that you uh, are worthy of our praise, Lord. Father, we're so thankful for marriage. We're thankful for uh, the community that we have. we have. We're so thankful for our relationships. And Father, thank you for uh, Jody sharing that lesson, Lord, and just uh, teaching us all about um, what it means to live in family and live in community. And Father, we know that uh, you have a plan for us. Father, we know that we need you. We know that we're desperate without you, that, uh, that we need that continual sanctification. Father, you've got to continually bring us closer to you. We're thankful for your grace and mercy that goes forever. Father, I'm thankful for Travis and Sarah. Lord, I'm thankful for their marriage. I'm thankful for that example to us. I'm thankful for all the, those that are our friends and family members that are married for so long and that legacy that they give us and teach us. Father, we just pray that we can uh, continue to uh, just remember that it's all because of Jesus. It's all because of your mercy and grace to us. And Father, we just pray that we can extend that to those outside this, uh, this building and outside of our fellowship, Lord. We just know that you love them as well, that you love everybody just the same, Lord. And we just praise you for that, and we just thank you for uh, bringing us all together. 
thank you and uh, uh, for the rain that you've given us recently. And Lord, we just pray we go uh, through this week, and we just pray that we share you with others. In Jesus' name, amen.